here. Um, so can you see the slides? Perfect. Wonderful. Um, well, so uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, the organizer, for, for this opportunity. And thank, thank you all for being here. Um, so uh, this project uh, um, is a collaboration between uh, uh, the um, uh, SQB Laboratory in Sorbonne Université uh, and uh, uh, the CIRI uh, at uh, ENS de Lyon. Um, so in order to tell you something uh, about the statistical analysis of coevolutionary signals that we are performing uh, on uh, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, I should first uh, uh, maybe uh, mention a few uh, structural details uh, well, in order to complete uh, what uh, uh, already uh, Stefan Teixeira uh, and, and his uh, fantastic presentation uh, had told uh, us all. So, um, yes. Uh, well, uh, again, as we know, um, the uh, S protein uh, is uh, responsible for uh, the internalization uh, and uh, the membrane fusion of uh, the um, coronavirus uh, uh, in, in general as a family. So uh, it is a, uh, a um, membrane protein. Uh, uh, it is a trimer uh, and it has a uh, very, very big uh, egg. Uh, ectodomain uh, here, uh, which can be divided into two uh, main subparts. Uh, the S1, which is responsible for docking to uh, the receptor uh, AC2 uh, in humans too, of course, uh, and then uh, the, uh, the S2 part, uh, which is responsible for fusing uh, the viral and the host membranes together uh, and um, help uh, the, the virion release uh, the genetic material. Um, the two uh, subregions are uh, cleaved uh, in, uh, in, two, uh, uh, in two locations by uh, first uh, a, a furin enzyme and then uh, a serine protease. Uh, and well, if you, if you look um, here uh, above the figure, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, find again uh, the two uh, regions S1 and S2 in this linear representation of uh, the sequence. <clears throat> So, um, and here we, we also realize that actually uh, the sequence contains uh, many more uh, subdomains, uh, each of which uh, with uh, its uh, specific function. And so where are these subdomains placed uh, in the uh, structure that we are seeing? Uh, well, let's start from uh, uh, the N-terminal domain. Uh, the N-terminal domain is placed here and uh, it functions as a stabilizer <coughs> and a protector uh, for the following uh, domain, which is the most important one, arguably uh, the uh, receptor binding domain, which is the one uh, that binds to uh, AC2 uh, upon a uh, conformational change. The conformational change is uh, communicated mechanically uh, to the uh, CTD1 and CTD2 domains, uh, if you can see them here in green, which are the C-terminal domain uh, one and two. Of course, not the C-terminal domain of the whole sequence, but only uh, of the S1 part. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, in, they, they end with the furin cleavage site here. And then there is the S2 uh, uh, region uh, which um, begins with uh, a, a linker part um, between the two cleavage sites S1, S2 and S2 prime. Uh, I haven't um, highlighted it here because well it is very important in, in um, throughout the conformational change but then functionally um, we are interested in, uh, in uh, other, other regions and other effects. So functionally we can just say that the S2 part begins with the fusion peptide, which is uh, highlighted here in, in blue, which um, inserts in the host cell membrane, uh, and uh, it is followed by a, a linker region and then uh, the uh, heptad repeat one, uh, which are these two helices here uh, in yellow, uh, followed again by the very core of the spike uh, protein structure, which is the central helix. The central helix um, uh, is followed by a connector domain, which connects it right with the stem of uh, the protein, where you can find the heptad repeat 2, the, uh, the part in red, which has a, a very high binding affinity for the heptad repeat 1 region. 
and then uh, we find the transmembrane domain and the small endodomain uh, of uh, uh, the spike protein, which is the C10. So this, of course, is the um, pre-fusion structure. Um, but, um, how does the structure um, uh, modifies and change conformation upon uh, membrane fusion? Well, luckily, among uh, the uh, more than 100 uh, uh, structures of the uh, S-protein that we have, we also have a partial uh, cryo-EM structure for the post-fusion conformation. Uh, and we can see that actually we can, uh, we can find again uh, many of the uh, subdomains that we, um, the, that we pinpointed in the pre-fusion structure. Uh, well, for example, uh, here you can find that the central helix uh, has stayed uh, basically in the same position, but, well, it, but is now elongated by uh, the HR1 um, um, a region here, uh, making a, a very, very long uh, um, a, a single helix, uh, which is in a bundle of three, of course, because it is a, a, a trimer in a way. Um, and then uh, we, we can also observe that now uh, HR1 and HR2 are, in fact, interacting, uh, as are interacting the fusion peptide and the, and the transmembrane domain, which are now both inserted in the membrane. Um, so. Um, uh, we have seen the, 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 uh, the two confirmations, let's say the, the, the beginning and the end of the story. Uh, what is the uh, mechanism leading from one to another? Well, of course, it is uh, quite complex, uh, and I don't think my uh, drawing uh, um, uh, makes justice to it. Uh, but in, um, in practice, it, it, it works like this. Of course, um, well, first, there is the cleavage of the uh, S1 uh, domain here represented in gray. Um, uh, the S2 domain is thus exposed. Uh, and then uh, uh, what happens is that uh, the central helix, as we saw, uh, is elongated by the heptide repeat one, uh, and the uh, fusion peptide is inserted in, uh, inside the the host membrane, uh, and then the real uh, conformational change uh, uh, starts happening, and the two parts are being brought together until uh, the uh, post-fusion uh, structure is found. So, of course, uh, in um, well, uh, among all the the, the strategy for uh, strategies for um, uh, anti um, anti SARS-CoV-2 uh, drugs, uh, there are many uh, which target this very process because, as you see, it is quite complex uh, and convoluted, uh, and try to stop uh, one of the stages of uh, the internaliza internalization slash fusion process. And there are, I think two main strategies to do that. Um, you either uh, devise some uh, uh, kind of neutralizing antibody uh, which binds to either to the NTD, the N-terminal domain, or uh, the receptor binding domain, and there exists at least 20 uh, that I know of uh, which um, have some kind of uh, uh, electron, um, let's say, uh, data, and they are described uh, in, uh, in recent papers. Uh, or uh, another strategy is to devise some other kind of antagonist peptide uh, which bind to uh, one of the, uh, of the intermediate structures uh, between uh, uh, the pre-fusion and the post-fusion, uh, and hinder the uh, fusion mechanism here. For example, in this article, um, uh, which is very interesting, uh, they uh, devised a, an antagonist peptide which, which binds at the place of uh, HR2 uh, and, uh, and thus hinders the binding of the real HR2 for, uh, from, the, from the spike protein, thus blocking uh, the, first, uh, the, the, the last stage of fusion. So our strategy belongs to uh, this uh, second class of methods. Uh, of course, uh, the first uh, question to pose uh, is uh, what region to target uh, in uh, in the in the um, uh, spike proteins uh, structure? Uh, whether there are better regions than uh, uh, the one, for example, chosen by uh, by the the authors of this paper, uh, and whether there is. Uh, a high enough affinity in order to do so. So um, our 
uh, strategy in, uh, uh, in short uh, works like that. Uh, we first perform a co-evolution analysis on uh, uh, the uh, whole structure of the S protein uh, in order to detect uh, the interaction sites and uh, mechanisms involved in uh, the fusion of, uh, of the two membranes. Uh, and then we uh, uh, hope try to synthesize an antagonist polypeptide in order to block exactly that stage. Of course, we have to also test uh, with uh, an infectivity assay um, uh, what uh, we are doing. Uh, and this is where the Siri uh, comes uh, into play. Uh, they have a fantastic assay uh, that they uh, applied uh, many times before uh, this project, uh, um, uh, which they do um, by, by producing viral pseudoparticles, which on the exterior uh, resemble a lot uh, the, the, the variant of the SARS-CoV-2, but in the interior they do not contain any kind of uh, genetic material for uh, replication. Uh, they instead contain a GFP gene uh, and thus uh, uh, the, the target cells can be tested for infectivity with a, a simple fluorescence uh, um, uh, assay. So, um, we are at the very beginning of uh, this whole project, um, so uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, but I will not be able to uh, show you uh, nothing more than uh, preliminary results uh, today. Uh, and we are uh, right now asking ourselves um, how uh, to perform uh, uh, the coevolution analysis and uh, what kind of regions uh, are uh, the best uh, in order to, uh, let's say, um, to bind our future antagonist peptides. So, um, uh, how is uh, our coevolution analysis performed? Um, the analysis is um, performed by a, uh, a program um, which is called BIS2, uh, which has been developed by uh, the analytical genomics group in the uh, LCQB laboratory uh, in, the, in the previous years. Uh, and uh, well, uh, the program BIS2 um, works with a multiple sequence alignment of uh, quite conserved sequences like the viral sequences of the uh, beta coronavirus family, for example. Uh, and uh, well, it takes any uh, pair of positions uh, in this um, in these multiple sequence alignments, and, and to any pair, it associates a coevolution score based on uh, the um, uh, similarity between uh, the two columns of uh, the uh, multiple sequence alignment. It thus builds a, a coevolution matrix, which then is clustered, uh, well, whose, uh, whose columns are clustered uh, by um, a score pattern similarity, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so for example, here uh, we see two clusters with uh, very similar patterns inside, uh, inside uh, each of, of the clusters. And of course, uh, each of these columns corresponds to a position uh, in uh, the structure of, of the protein, which uh, uh, has to be analyzed. So we can trace uh, them back uh, to the structure. For example, here I represented cluster A in green and cluster B in, uh, in pink. And we can actually uh, see from this scheme uh, that um, coevolution can uh, show itself either by uh, direct structural contact, um, uh, which can be actually uh, visualized on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the structure, but can also not show itself from a structural point of view, either because the parts will interact structurally, but in uh, all another conformation, or because the parts interact just functionally. Uh, for example, they are antagonist to uh, any other kind of drugs, or uh, they are connected by a loss theory, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So for example, um, one of the first um, signals that we got uh, in the uh, coevolution analysis was between uh, a um, residue uh, in, uh, well, in the proximity of the fusion peptide and a residue uh, placed here 
in the uh, transmembrane domain. Uh, and of course, well, uh, they are uh, very far apart in uh, the prefusion structure, uh, whereas, of course, uh, they are much closer in uh, the uh, post-fusion structure, and thus they are able to, uh, to uh, interact either structurally or functionally. We actually don't know for sure because we don't have that part of the structure yet. Uh, so, but of course, um, um, so far we don't uh, want actually to, um, uh, to, to concentrate on one uh, specific signal. We uh, want to survey uh, all uh, the possible coevolutionary signals, and in order to do so, we have to build a very good um, uh, multiple sequence alignment. So what we did was to take uh, many, uh, well, let's say an, an, an extensive set of sequences uh, belonging to the Sarbacovirus lineage, uh, which is a, a, a smaller group with respect to the beta coronavirus uh, presented you by uh, Stefan Kereshia. Uh, and um, uh, well, uh, Sarbacovirus lineage uh, includes, of course, SARS-CoV-2 uh, sequences infecting human, but also SARS-CoV-2 one sequences, both infecting humans and infecting only uh, only uh, other animals. Um, and the, the the important information to retain here is that, um, uh, albeit um, albeit very related, there were two different zoonosis events leading to the spillover of SARS-CoV in uh, uh, 2003, 2004, uh, and uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, they actually uh, are uh, two recombinations uh, at the level of the uh, receptor binding domain. Uh, and so, um, albeit they are different and they were independent, uh, they, are, they are anyway very, very related in sequence, uh, as, we, um, as we can uh, check here and uh, in this very interesting paper by Lee uh, and other authors. Um, so, um, um, if we ask, uh, if we have to ask a first question, uh, that would be, what are the differences between uh, the subtree uh, connected to SARS-1 and the subtree connected to SARS-2? And we can visualize them here on the structure uh, of uh, the spike protein. So uh, here in purple, I uh, reported all the um, uh, all the, the positions corresponding to um, the um, amino acids that were um, conserved in the uh, SARS-1 subtree that were conserved also in the SARS-2 subtree, but which differ from uh, one subtree to the other. Uh, so the mutations between the conserved sites in SARS-1 and SARS-2 subtrees. And you can see that there is uh, an extensive and quite dense uh, distrib distributions of, uh, of residues, uh, which confirms that SARS-2 must have been present in animals for a long time, as uh, Stefan Kreshia again uh, was saying. Uh, it's fantastic to uh, find uh, all these uh, um, um, observations in, 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 uh, in his talk. Um, but then, uh, if these are the differences, which are instead uh, the um, uh, the, the similarities between the two spillovers. Uh, well, um, they are represented here in yellow. Uh, and they are the common traits uh, of the SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 recombination events. Uh, and as you see, uh, most of them, uh, more than 90% of them, are localized in the receptor binding domain uh, area. Uh, which is no surprise because, again, uh, the RBD is the recombination site for both uh, these uh, spillover events. Uh, okay, so these are two nice confirmations, but then uh, let's, um, uh, let's pose the, the real question, which is, uh, which are the parts um, uh, which mutated only in the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus and uh, which could be targeted by uh, a, um, an antagonist peptide? I represent them in uh, uh, orange here, uh, and they are uh, mainly... Excuse me, Eduardo? Oui. Um, uh, it would be really nice if you could uh, conclude in the, the ongoing minutes, in the forthcoming minutes. Yes, of course. I am. I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. Don't worry.
Um, so um, we um, we pinpoint four uh, regions. Um, uh, the first of which is uh, at the S one S two cleavage site, and now we know what um, because the the S one S two cleavage site now uh, can be bound by neuropilin one, uh, which is an effect we see only in SARS CoV two. So again, another confirmation. And the other uh, the other three regions are the uh, at the uh, RBD CTD one boundary here uh, at the N NTD um, uh, fusion peptide boundary, and then there is one in the connector domain. Of course, we have no idea uh, why uh, those regions are placed like that, but they could be uh, good targets for uh, the um, uh, antagonist peptide. So summarizing uh, the color the coevolution analysis that we have done, uh, and we, that we will continue doing, uh, shed some light on the interplay between structural and phylogenetic aspects uh, of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, and also uh, will help us uh, finding some, uh, some uh, uh, superficial regions in order to design our synthetic peptides which could hinder the fusion of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 and then will be tested by the infectivity assay by the CIRI. With this, I thank you for your attention and again, I thank you, the organizer. Yeah, thank you very much, Eduardo, and, uh, and sorry we have to keep the, the schedule uh, most uh, importantly in, in order to, to allow for uh, several questions. So uh, also, before we move to the question, I, uh, I would like to stress that uh, uh, it, it would be really nice if uh, you could introduce yourself very briefly before asking the questions so that everybody knows who's, who's asking. Okay, so do we have any, any further questions? Hi, this is Gwen André Leroux. I have a question. Um, uh, how can you imagine it that you can reconciliate the glycosylation site with uh, all the binding residues uh, of your spike interaction domain? Thanks. This is a very interesting question uh, indeed. So, of course, we are keeping uh, in uh, mind uh, the glycosylation uh, um, dist distribution. Uh, again, we have seen uh, in the previous talk uh, uh, a very nice figure by, uh, by Lorenzo Casalino and the Amaro Lab uh, with the whole dis distribution and dynamics of these uh, glycans. Uh, of course, uh, we, we, we keep this in mind. That, for example, we also have to, to keep into account that um, the spike protein is always represented as, as straight but actually the head of the uh, spike protein is, um, is often um, on one side, uh, it has an angle of uh, about 40, 45 degrees. So maybe on the other side, even if there are uh, glycans, we, we can um, try to snitch a, a small polypeptide. We're keeping it. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Frederick speaking. I have a quick question about um, in the middle of this slide. So you are showing one spike involved in diffusion, but how many how many spikes are do the job? It's very unlikely to have only one, right? No, of course, yes. Uh, well, so uh, the, the seminal work by Kai. Uh, which is one of the uh, works that I uh, that I take as a as a, as a reference. Well, they say that um, there are uh, in uh, on average five or six uh, um, spikes which are active. Uh, I think at the same uh, time, but that, that that was actually a, 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 a let's say a. Um, a preliminary results, if you want, because it was uh, early uh, in the discovery of, uh, of uh, the SARS-CoV-2. Um, so yes, uh, it definitely happens many times at once, uh, and, and the, the membrane, the host membrane is broken in uh, many different points. And this is why uh, the peptide should have high affinity and actually should also be um, able to bind uh, the pre-fusion confirmation of uh, the spike and not just the post-fusion because it enhances the possibilities of the fusion not to happen. Okay, thank you. 